I'm Bill Hubscher. And I'm Lori Meggs, and welcome to Focus on Marshall. For this episode, we're here for a very special celebration. That's right. We're in the Payload Operations Center for a major milestone. That's right. They're celebrating their 10th anniversary of supporting the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. Over that time, they have supported more than 1,100 science experiments aboard the station, and they'll play a critical role for years to come. And Lori, we're also going to be visiting a group out here at Marshall that are working on another major project to help improve the strength of the structures of propellant tanks and also make them lighter. So we've got a lot to show you. Let's get started. We're here now with Mike Roberts. He is the test conductor for the shell buckling knockdown factor test that just finished. Uh, how do you think it went? It went awesome. Every, everybody's uh, happy right now, for sure. So tell us a little bit about what Marshall's role is in all of this. Well, Marshall actually built the test article similar to an ET barrel. Um, we also transported it to 4572 and instrumented it for several months. It has over 900 strain gauges on it, um, and we moved it up here to stack up and to test. So what all goes into to a test of this magnitude? Well, um, again, mainly a lot of instrumentation, like I mentioned before, 900 strain gauges, um, a lot of hours of stack up and logistics of moving it around the center, a lot of shimming around both surfaces, making sure we got pristine boundary conditions, um, that kind of thing. And I think after today's test, you also have to be a little bit patient. We do, we do. Sometimes you have to change things on the fly like we did um, at 105% load. We had to back down to 80% load, reduce our pressure, increase our load again, and get uh, some buckling results out of, out of that. So Mike, what happens with all the data that you and your team have collected now? Well, the data that gets processed, our main, um, our main uh, product in this group is test data. We give it to the Langley test engineers um, and engineer, research engineers. They, in turn, um, make new shell buckling knockdown factors, which in turn makes lighter um, cylinders and rocket propellant tanks. So this will come in handy for the next round of uh, vehicles we expect to see. It will. It will come in very handy for the future of any heavy lift vehicle. All right. Thanks very much, Mike. You're welcome. I'm here with Mark Hilberger, and he's the principal investigator from Langley Research Center for the shell buckling test. And Mark, we're glad to have you here today. Thank you. Tell me what we were trying to learn with this test. Well, uh, this test follows a series of smaller tests that we ran over the past couple of years here at Marshall um, to prove that these smaller scale tests can be scaled up to large scale uh, heavy lift type vehicles. Tell us how this fits into the future of spacecraft. Well, this is a critical uh, test for us to uh, validate our computer simulations and our understanding of uh, the buckling specifically of very large uh, launch vehicle structures so that we may update some of the old design guidelines that we currently still use. Tell us what you actually did during the test. What, what were we looking at? Well, during the test, um, there were several sequences of loads that we went through. Uh, first, uh, we pressurized the shell to uh, one PSI of internal pressure and then we proceeded to uh, load the shell up to uh, over 800,000 pounds. And um, we did some uh, modifications of the loading sequence because the shell was performing actually much better than we had thought. And uh, so we released some load, reduced the pressure, and then went on uh, loading the shell until we, we buckled it. We buckled it well. So the test went well today? Oh, the test went fantastic, yes. Talking about the technology, I noticed that little black dots on this. I mean, that, that's really high tech right there, putting black dots on a can. Yeah. Tell me what that's for. Oh yeah, that's, that's very high tech. Um, the dots you see behind you are uh, placed on a test article, and then we monitor them during the test with uh, uh, high fidelity digital cameras. And the cameras can pick up the minute uh, changes in that pattern. And from that, we can calculate uh, what the deformations are and the strains are in the test and in real time. So it's a very powerful tool. So now that the test is over, what's next? Oh, well, we have a lot of test data to go through, over 800 uh, instruments and gauges that we need to, uh, to look through and, and uh, all of our uh, video and compare that back to what our predictions say should have happened and see where we did well and see where we need to, uh, to uh, tighten up our predictions on and then slowly migrate all that information that we're gathering from the tests and analysis into some new uh, design recommendations for heavy lift type vehicles. All right, well, congratulations on the test today, and go look over that data. That's All better, right, thanks better a lot. for you than me. Whew. Thanks, Mark. 
I'm here with Julie Robinson, and she is the International Space Station Program Scientist from the Johnson Space Center. And Julie, you're here for our 10th anniversary of the Payload Operations Center. Let's talk about what this center has meant to the International Space Station Program and the science that it's accomplished. It's amazing to realize the center's been operating for a decade now, and the way that they have transformed the way that we manage laboratories in space is just amazing. The professionals here uh, make sure that every bit of research that's being done for hundreds and hundreds of investigators around the world is successful. And I'm sure you hear a lot of feedback from those investigators about how the Payload Operations Center helps them accomplish their goals. I hear feedback from the investigators about the way they help them respond when something doesn't go as planned, the way that they help investigators get new data collected when they find something, a new discovery that they're excited about. And even I hear things about the Southern hospitality, the way that the uh, POIC members here take care of them when they're here in town doing their operations. And let's talk a little bit about the science over 10 years. A lot has been accomplished. You know, it's, it's really amazing because some of the things that have happened on the space station in the last 10 years were not what we expected when we originally developed the laboratories. For example, um, we have two different teams working on developing vaccines for salmonella food poisoning using results from research done in space. Well, Julie, I know that everyone here is thrilled that you came today and, and to be a part of this anniversary. Thanks so much for joining us. It's been my pleasure. We're joined now by Pat Patterson. She is one of the Payload Operations Directors here at the Payload Operations Center. And Pat, if you would first, tell us a little bit about what the Payload Operations Center does. Okay, um, we're the center that enables everybody to get their science accomplished, their NASA science and partner science accomplished on board the International Space Station. So we work um, ahead of time to get products ready for the crew to execute from. We then um, also gather all the resources for what the science experiments are going to need and figure out how to lay those out in a plan so that we can get the most science done every day. And you have a, a big part of the puzzle in that you work with both the scientists and those astronauts on orbit. That is correct. We're sort of the middleman between the scientists on the ground and the crew um, orbiting on board station. So you have to be very versatile. That is very true. <laughs> now, a lot of our viewers may not be aware that you were actually here for the very first mission 10 years ago. Tell, tell us a little bit, first of all, about that mission in particular. I was. Um, 5A.1 launched on March 8th. Um, 10 years ago and it carried up the first MPLM which also had our first NASA utilization rack. It was the Human Research Facility 1 rack, the HRF 1 rack. Um, and I was the, my team and I were the lucky ones that were on console. It was, we were working midnight shift. It was about 5.30 in the morning when the shuttle launched off and we knew our lives were never going to be the same after that, that our jobs just got way more exciting. So how, did it, how did it feel knowing that you're going to have such an impact on, on the agency's mission? Um, I don't know that that really hit us at the time that the shuttle took off, um, but it's something that we're very proud of. I mean, we, we are very, very proud of what we've been able to accomplish with the crew and the scientists to get station accomplished and to benefit mankind on Earth. Well, on behalf of all, all of those scientists and those astronauts and those who have benefited from all that science, thank you so much for being here. Oh, you're very welcome. Bill, it never ceases to amaze me the work that's done here. Well, we've got some very talented people here, some of whom are working right here behind us right now. That's right, working hard. <laughs> Join us next time as we focus on Marshall.